it's my utmost. You ever uh, like kind of read a devotional and went, huh? <laughs> Have you ever gone, wait a minute now, let me get this right, Lord. You want me to eat your flesh and drink your blood? You know, and then you decided, uh, I can't do that. That's cultic and went the other way. Or you were led by the spirit and you were walking down the street and you turned to the right and you saw some Jehovah's Witnesses and you knew they were a cult. So you didn't want to witness to them because after all, they're a cult. Hmm. And God said, just talk to them. <laughs> Sometimes it's tough. You know, I mean, there are things that God... If he hasn't done it to you yet, keep reading this and he will. He will confront you in areas of understanding that it's not the author that's wrong. It's our understanding of it. Because God brings these wise men and sages of the faith into our lives for a purpose. And it's designed in order to cause us to consider well, you know, where we're at. Because we may have been cudgeled and babied, you know, and given milk toast, you know, in order to think that we're eating the meat of the word until something causes us to really crucify ourselves and to wake up to the reality that hey we're you know pretty carnal ourselves we're not like the spiritual head of the, all the generations before us but we might be the last generation for a good reason we could be the first is last and the last shall be first and uh, we may be the bottom of the barrel when it comes to faith in god we may not know it all as much as we think we do and that there may be more in regards to the faith of the martyrs who died and understood that, hey, it wasn't about violence. It was about the sharing the gospel, regardless of the cost. And in utmost, you know, I think about that at times and it bothers me because I grew up in the generation that had the draft. I grew up in a generation where we had to go to Vietnam. And we, in our high school days, knew that it wasn't a question of being honoring the country and serving our country because of some militaristic idealism that somehow, oh, we're John Wayne's, you know, and we're going to go out and it's the honorable thing to kill the enemy because, after all, they are the Taliban. Or that, you know, we could pick up our guns, you know, and shoot someone in the face, literally, and watch their brains explode all over us and not realize that there would be a consequence to the blood that was shed for the sake of freedom and the PTSD. You see, the consequence of violence in the world is one that Jesus will not tolerate. He was not a violent man. He wasn't a doormat like people keep trying to make it out to be because I defy any person to tell me, looking at the book of Revelation, when the tribulation period comes, that that God is a doormat. Fine. Deal with him personally and then tell me what you think. But in the reality of when Jesus came, he did not come to exercise power and authority. He came to demonstrate subservience and obedience to the Father's will. So when you go out there and you're trying to exercise and command things into existence and declaring things to be, I question whether or not you're doing it with Jesus or in the name of Jesus, because there's a difference. Jesus warned that those who did it in his name might not be doing it with him, but they're doing it for him. And while it was done, Jesus will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Why? It could be that in seeking to save the peoples that are suffering under some terrible regime, we've deprived someone of salvation by murdering them in the name of God. It's a tough thing to call. But you see, in the Jesus movement, we already knew what that was because we were hippies and we believed in peace, love, and joy. And we knew that God was not about killing and destroying and annihilating peoples, but that he came into the world to save them from themselves, to save the people. 
And at one point in time, we knew we would die as martyrs, but now we're willing to kill in the name of God. So my question to you is, you may not want to learn all that God has for you because it may cause you to challenge the very precepts you were raised on. Because I know that there's a great Semper Fi going on that I'm willing to die for my country, but I'm not willing to die for my enemy. I'm not willing to lay down my life, not just for the brethren, but for those who despitefully use me and hate me and call all manner of name against me. Oh, I'm willing to set up a society, utopian society, an American dream to give the people what they deserve. No bullies, no hardships, no aggravations, no confrontations, no aggravations. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Faith is not about being able to take up a gun and kill someone. Faith is about being able to put the gun down and let them kill you. There are too many stories now in our modern generation of children, children who were in hostile situations. And they knew God so well that they were willing to say, pick me. Jesus loves you and died with that on their lips. I question myself, although I've always lived by this and I don't believe in violent means by any measure, but I question myself whether or not we have strayed far from the path that Jesus chose for us or whether we're making American Christianity something God will reject. Whereby shall I know? I thank thee, O Father, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. Matthew 11:25. In spiritual relationship, we do not grow up step by step. We are either there or we are not. God does not cleanse us more and more from sin. But when we are in the light, walking in the light, we are cleansed from all sin. It is a question of obedience and instantly the relationship is perfected. God sees us as perfected for what Jesus has already done. Turn away for one second out of obedience, and darkness and death are all at once at work in me. All God's revelations are sealed until they are opened to us by obedience. You will never get them opened by philosophy or by thinking. Immediately you obey, a flash of light comes. Bingo! You've done it. God's there. Let God's truth work in you by soaking in it, not by worrying into it, not by trying to manipulate it, not by trying to do it. The only way you get to know is to stop trying to find out and by being born again. Obey God in the thing he shows you immediately. And instantly the next thing is opened up. One reads many stories on the work of the Holy Spirit. When five minutes of drastic obedience would make things as clear as a sunbeam. I suppose I shall under these thing, understand these things someday. No, you won't. You can understand them now, or you won't. It is not study that does it, but obedience. If you accept what God says, God says what he means, then it's simple. You know what he said. The tiniest fragment of obedience and heaven opens, and the profoundest truth of God's are yours right away. God will never reveal what you know already. Beware of becoming wise and prudent. Part of the frustration I've always had with seeing Christianity going in a certain direction has been that aspect of, why me? I'm just reading what it says and it's obvious to me. <coughs> and I didn't accept people's explanation of what it said. So like when Jesus said, love your enemy, I didn't take an explanation of it because at the end of the chapter it said, blessed are you if you do these things. So I didn't think it was like, Oh, well, I have to interpret it in order to do it because he didn't mean what he said. He was just using it as an allegory and a metaphor. When in the end of the chapter, it says that you are a wise man if you do them. So I think maybe you need to take the hoodwinks off and put on the reality check. 
if you believe the Bible says what it means, it means what it says, then you don't need to go to the Old Testament and try to create some kind of hierarchical work strip where you're going to make everyone do the Ten Commandments. But I'll tell you one thing you do need to do. You do need to read the Sermon on the Mount. And you do need to figure out that Jesus meant what he said and said what he meant. And that every time that the disciples tried to criticize one another and beat up one another, God was saying, hey, no, don't. Hey, you don't know. God the Father gave them their ability from himself, you know, and you're touching his anointed. Don't do that. Leave them alone. Let them go do their thing. God will judge them. You don't. Judge not, lest you be judged with the same measure that you were judging. But don't judge. So people like to try to invent excuses for what Jesus said. How about stop it? Quit. Don't make up excuses for what Jesus said just because you don't like it. Be real about it. I can't do it. That's real. And God won't put you in that position. But don't lie about it. Don't lie about Jesus said, I can go out and kill in the name of God. Don't lie about what Jesus said about loving your enemies. Don't lie to yourself. For God's sake. Otherwise, you may find yourself outside of God's grace. Because the Jesus you thought you were following wasn't a bodybuilder. And he wasn't some American idea of John Wayne or some tabloid journalism concept of being some kind of like, oh, well, he fits for this and then doesn't fit for that. And he goes like this and he goes like that and he goes over there and he goes like this. Or he's got some talis on, you know, and he's got some tzitzis or whatever. Jesus was the son of God. Jesus at any point in time could have stopped every heartbeat in the universe. Jesus is God. So if Jesus is God and he was willing to die and suffer at the hands of men, I don't think he's calling you to take up your guns and have the freedom to bear arms so that you could go out and kill in the name of God. I think what he's wanting you to do is to save souls in the name of Jesus to the glory of God the Father. So you go do what you want to do. The consequences are your own choice. But I know this, you'll never get through this book by thinking that you can do your own thinking and by going your own way and by doing anything less than what Jesus said to do. Because this book will make you go right back to the Sermon on the Mount and live it. And that's why Keith Green to this day is still, his songs are so powerful, are so full of the Holy Spirit. So much so that God loved him enough to take him home. I say because he would not have survived the times we live in now. But he would have changed the world. Because there would have been others like him. As there are today. Who know that it's not about what we do or say or feel or think. But it's about what Jesus said. And God knows I hope you follow the words that Jesus said. Because the words that man say will put you right in the valley of Megiddo fighting. Supposedly for Israel, maybe. And you'll wind up fighting against God in the end. 